you everyone for joining us this afternoon. I'm Diane davis Sakura, Associate Professor in the College of Architecture and Environmental Design and co-director of the Environmental Science and Design Research Initiative here at Kent State University. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the 2020 Esri Distinguished Speaker presentation and gallery exhibition by world-renowned scholar, Professor Rachel Armstrong, an event also co-presented by the College of Architecture and Environmental Design. Esri is one of five research institutes and initiatives at Kent State and is dedicated to the research and in investigation of natural and built systems, environmental sustainability, and the cultivation of new knowledge, products, and solutions in this era of human influence. In collaboration with my co-director, Dr. Chris Blackwood, Esri's programming is developed in an effort to expand the range of student, faculty, and public activities um, that expand interdisciplinary scholarship and contribute to the global conversation about humanity and the environment. For the year 2019 and 2020, Esri is excited to have presented activities around the topic of biodesign, a theme that was selected for its inclusion um, and diversity in terms of range of academic fields that it engages, and its focus on innovative design approaches to environmental problems. This year's 2020 Esri Symposium was canceled and rescheduled um, due to uh, the COVID-19 that took place in March. Um, but a series of events have been rescheduled and a transition as a series of uh, virtual sessions, uh, including today's special event uh, that also kicks off this year's CAD lecture series. Um, during Esri's uh, year of biodesign, um, it would, we could not imagine a more accomplished scholar and champion for working with living systems and biological processes in ways that challenge how we think about life and the context of living things in our environment. Um, a brief video preview of the exhibition associated with today's talk will be shown immediately following Dr. Armstrong's presentation, after which we'll host questions and answer session using the chat function. So please feel free to type questions um, following the lecture. So now I'd like to invite Mark Mister, Dean of the College of Architecture and Environmental Design to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Diane. Welcome to the first CAED lecture and exhibition of the fall 2020 semester and our first virtual lecture broadcasted on our YouTube channel. You know, this semester's lecture series features internationally renowned architects, interior designers and landscape architects as well as a series of conversations between CAED faculty members and selected thought leaders. They'll focus on questions relating to their own scholarly pursuits and how it relates back to the future of our professions. We'll also be webcasting the Cleveland-based CUDC Urban Design and Landscape Architecture talk series focused on urban social issues. This lecture is special, not only because we have one of the planet's most daring and integrative thinkers, not only because it's 10 p.m. in Newcastle where our distinguished guest is presenting, but because we're talking about the future of design, the future of flipping the paradigm and leveraging nature instead of resisting it. It's also special because we have brought her here in a cross-disciplinary partnership with Kent State's cross-disciplinary environmental design, science and design initiative, ESDRI. And I wanna thank Dr. Chris Blackwood and Diane davis Sikora, co-directors of ESDRI an initiative that's critically important to the future. I met Rachel in 2010 when we brought her to Rensselaer for a talk and panel on inhabiting other worlds, microgravity, perception, physiology, and design as a way of expanding our thinking about design in our own world. And she did. We could not have a more fitting scholar to present thoughts and work relating to the topic of biodesign, living architecture, or more generally on radical form of integration that incorporates natural living systems into and with synthetic designs at a range of scales from the cellular to the urban. Rachel Armstrong is a professor of experimental architecture at the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at Newcastle University in the UK. She explores how buildings can incorporate the properties of living systems to become living architectures. 
She was coordinator for the Open Living Architecture Project between 2016 and 19, and coordinates the EU ALICE Project, Active Living Infrastructure Controlled Environment. She is a Rising Waters II Fellow with the Robert Rosenberg Foundation and a 2010 Senior TED Fellow with over 1.5 million views of her TED Talk on Biological Reconstitution of the Foundations of Venice. She's a member of the Hub for Biotechnology in the Built Environment at Newcastle University and director and founder of the Experimental Architecture Group, whose work has been published and exhi exhibited internationally. Dr. Armstrong holds an honors degree with two academic prizes from the University of Cambridge, a medical degree from the University of Oxford, and was a member to the Royal College of New Zealand General Practitioners between 2005 and 15. She also holds a PhD in architecture from the University of London's Bartlett School of Architecture. Early in her career, she made the transition from medicine to architecture, realizing that for a holistic understanding and implementation of design, science, the arts, and humanities needed to be integrated. Her work typically involves the creation of multidisciplinary research teams to address complex real world challenges and developing prototypes that employ living technologies that utilize biological systems to perform work, radically change the impacts of human habitation on the environment, and fundamentally rethink building. I want to welcome Professor Rachel Armstrong to the virtual stage. And please feel free to develop your questions in the chat box as the lecture proceeds. And please keep your mics muted. Dr. Armstrong? Thank you. I'm just going to put up the PowerPoint. And thank you for such a warm and wonderful introduction. Um, so here I go. Oops. Let's see. Share. The old world is dying, and the new regime struggles to be born. This is the time of biodesign. Modernity has left us ill prepared to address nature's radical openness, where the living world's own creativity renders it strange and hostile. In our attempts to rescue the world from the Titan climate emergency, we fail to see it as the world acting upon us. Struggling most of all with those dynamics that question the human centeredness of the planet, we find ourselves in a place of social and even creative surrender as the frames of reference we habitually use to know and control the world mutate. With our recognition of this profound mutation in our relation to the world, we should, to quote Bruno Latour, have already modified the basis of our existence from top to bottom. We should have begun to change our food, our habitats, our means of transport, our cultural technologies, in short, our mode of production. I wrote this talk as the coronavirus pandemic unfolded, rapidly changing world events. The cancellation of Kent University's seventh Environmental Science and Design Research Symposium in mid-March was a stark reminder that nature's search for a new equilibrium is fast outpacing us. My hope for this online conference is to draw attention to biodesign's potential for ethical disruption and as a catalyst for innovation in the resiliency of natural and built systems to radically transform the way we live and work. The physical sciences that brought certainty, precision, uniformity and control into our lives throughout the 20th century assumed the environment to be neutral. Until now, it's been entirely reasonable to expect that matter and the mechanistic frameworks that enabled it perform as instructed, obedient, nature's um, fundamental laws of control. But as people and nature rapidly became equivalent, complex planetary scale disturbances have come into play. This climate emergency 
has changed the rules of engineering. The nonlinear behaviors that typify the climate disturbance in all its manifestations, wildfires, tornadoes, rising waters, melting ice caps, devastating storms, floods, droughts, and pandemics, bring the environment into play, where it is no longer background noise in our lives, but a powerful actor on the world stage generating new problems. So alternative ways of thinking with associated tool sets are needed that are capable of soothing our unquiet world. Marking a milestone in our thinking and practice, the systemic challenges that gave rise to the pandemic coincide with a new era in engineering unleashed by applications of biological knowledge. Within this milieu, advances in biotechnology offer a dynamic set of solutions for a spectrum of challenges from the body to the environment. Enabled by late 20th century insights, biological processes can be deployed in ways in which Tom Knight from MIT has described as the nanotech that works. Laboratories equipped with gene splicing enzymes can decipher the entire genetic composition of organisms and change the function of individual cells. Revolutions in medical treatments include tissue regeneration, bioprinting, stem cell research, and biosensors. And a new portfolio of environmental solutions can generate circular economy-based systems associated with zero waste policies. Despite its, its ingenuity, biotechnology alone cannot provide complete solutions to the ongoing challenges nor meet every aspect of our needs. Its portfolio of operations is still very much emerging within a rapidly mutating socioeconomic context, and its potential is only just being unleashed. Frameworks for decision-making are needed to appropriately deploy this biotechnological re revolution in ways that are different than Anthropocene thinking and contribute rather than diminish our living realm. The prospect of an era of advanced biotechnology brings with it lessons from the nanobio infocogno or NBIC convergence, which also sought complex and nuanced ends. In two, 2001, Mikhail Rocco and William Sims Bainbridge organized a science-oriented meeting at the National Science Foundation that brought together leaders in science, industry and government. Their workshop considered how cutting edge developments in key scientific disciplines, namely nanotechnology, biomedicine, information technology, and cognitive science could be integrated to advance human capabilities. The overview of the first NBIC convergence report promised a golden age of human development that would, would, that would result in necessary far reaching societal change. The report proposed Moving forward simultaneously along many of these paths could achieve a golden era that would be a turning point for human productivity and quality of life. Technological convergence could become the framework for human convergence. The 21st century could end in world peace, universal prosperity, and evolution to a higher level of compassion and accomplishment. It is hard to find the right metaphor to see a century into the future, but it may be that humanity would become like a single distributed and interconnected brain based in new core pathways of society. This acclaimed new renaissance was reviewed by Alfred Norgman for the European Union in a report entitled Converging Technologies for the European Knowledge Society, which highlighted the agenda setting character of technological convergence, placing a strong emphasis on social and political oversight. Sharing many ambitions with the MBIC, the emerging field of biodesign also aims to bring about radical change through applications of emerging and advanced biotechnology. The term biodesign was first popularized within architecture and design in 2012, when William Myers and Paola Antonelli 
curated a publication in Cabinet of Curiosities, including works such as Kate Orff's Oyster Texture, Marcus Larson's Dune, and Ginger Creed Dossier's Biobrig, to name a few. Today's biodesign continues as a diverse discipline that has forged radically interdisciplinary practices that work with organic substrates. And the field is growing. Emerging at thresholds and intersections between disciplines, the realm of influence exceeds its curatorially bestowed definition to incorporate a range of existing disciplines, organicism via systems biology, biotechnology, bioart, biomimicry, bionics, and new materialism. By generating epistemic things, which are capable of producing present and future knowledge, biodesign is more than a set of biotechnical instruments and provides a training ground for the concept it seeks to interrogate, biology. Typically, biodesign incorporates living materials, organisms, or moist media into a portfolio of products, such as fungi, algae, yeast, bacteria, and cultured tissues that perform a range of functions from new textile sources to energy generators, digital storage systems, and air purifiers. The responsible transformation of the way we live can only ever be partly achieved through new tools and scientific insights alone. So appropriate ethical, social, cultural, and political frameworks must also be incorporated into the innovation process. Biodesign is therefore founded on critical perspectives that exceed utilitarian notions of efficiency and function, and instead offers holistic approaches for tackling ecological challenges that can be developed in fair, inclusive, ethical, and culturally engaged ways. By considering biology in its broadest context, biodesign can also engage with significant factors that impede necessary change. For example, the biopolitics of biopower that inframe common assumptions about life, biology, and nature deeply affect our identities and modes of subjectification and can constrain what we are able to do to such a degree that when unchallenged are as much a threat to our welfare through the loss of freedoms as ongoing issues of planetary welfare. Making a complete transition from modes of human development that deplete planetary resources to ones that enrich them cannot be realized by humans alone. Our assumptions about and relationship with the living realm must be reassessed through a more than human centered ethics. Donna Haraway's 1991 Cyborg Manifesto proposed the inclusive treatment of ambiguous identities or cyborgs, which are frequently produced by biodesign through a combination of fiction and lived experience where notions of public and bodily reality can be remapped. By invoking the intimate relation between cyborgs and people, Haraway made a profound comment on societies of the third millennium, that we are not just human, but more than human, raising a whole new realm of ethical concerns. In this next section, I will detail a number of projects that I've worked on as an exploration of the scope of biodesign, spanning from the 1990s to the present, which aims to show how the constituent practices and concepts have evolved. So the first case study concerns Stellark's extra ear. In my last clinical year of medicine, I took a sabbatical in India, where I worked with a hand surgeon in a leprosy colony. Performing tendon transfers on people with impaired thumb movement, their grip could be restored by sacrificing the function of not so important finger tendons and inserting these instead into the thumb base. With rewired digits and an intensive rehabilitation process, the person's quality of life could be transformed. Alterations to their lifestyles did not stop at the body, but also extended into their social realms. 
pot handles for stoves were designed to be about a metre long, so nobody got close enough to the heat to burn themselves. And tools were developed with high mechanical advantages, so they could be operated with just one little finger. Where people were once excluded from a community through their condition, they could now earn an income and raise a family. The combination of bodily design, technology and environment was so intriguing and ethically challenging that I volunteered as a technical advisor to work with artists like Helen Chadwick, who incorporated medical imagery in her work, and Orlon, who used plastic surgery to create auto self-portraiture in search of a new kind of beauty. Around 1996, Stellark, now a professor at Curtin University in Perth, was inspired to grow a third ear following developments by Robert Langer at MIT and Charles Vacanti of Harvard University, who had incubated the world's first artificial ear on the back of a mouse. As I'd been working with artists, he approached me with a design proposing to grow the appendage on his face. I advised against his chosen location as it was over the facial nerve. And to guide him further, I introduced him to plastic surgeon, Mr. Tim Goodacre in Oxford, who further counseled him about the highly specialized nature of the surgery. On his website, Stellark states, the surgical techniques for ear reconstruction have been developed, so this is a plausible project. The difficulty is in finding the appropriate medical assistance to realize it. Since 1997, there were several instances where doctors initially expressed interest in assisting, but then changed their minds. At the time of Stellart's proposition, biodesign did not formally exist. Art science collaborations were barely a thing. And despite my presenting Stellark as the first live augmented patient at the 2000 Nuffield Grand Round for Orthopaedics in Oxford, it took a further 10 years for him to raise the necessary funds and learn to develop the extra ear. This was unsurprising as the premise of Stellark's design was technically and ethically challenging for the medical profession. You don't really expect people to understand the art component of all this, said Stellark. This ear is not for me. I've got two good ears to hear with. This ear is a remote listening device for people in other places. Finally, a surgical team in the United States was able to perform the procedure, including a Bluetooth implant. But this had to be removed soon afterwards, owing to infection. Since then, Stellark has also made a mini version of the ear at Symbiotica. And the most recent manifestation I've seen is as an appendage on the back of a mobile phone, and maybe the best of all worlds, especially since bodily interventions are increasingly under the control of regulatory bodies. The second case study examines biodesign as its limits. Neither biology nor zoology includes the study of all lively things, whose current membership is delimited by Charles Darwin's cellular tree of life. This household of nature has not, however, always been confined to the organismal kingdoms of animals and plants. But according to Carl Linnaeus, the pioneer of binomial nomenclature, also includes aspects of the mineral kingdom, revealing their different degrees of liveliness. He notes, stones grow, plants grow and live, animals grow, live and feel. In search of the limits of biodesign as a practice, I look to the origin of life sciences to understand what a minimal unit of living design would be that was recognizably lively, but did not meet the formal criteria for being alive. In this way, blind spots in our thinking about the natural realm could be exposed, revealing new stories about the living world. Such a tool set was not immediately available. So I developed a cytoplasmic manifesto, which petitioned a non-deterministic view of life that was not embedded in the scientific and cultural legacy of DNA. 
To make this more than rhetoric, I sought a model that could embody dynamic material properties of the cell that were not under the direct control of genes so that I could then experimentally observe and test these concepts. In 2008, I attended Takashi Ikigami's lecture on his work with Martin Hanzuk at the Artificial Life 11 conference in Winchester, where he demonstrated a simple chemical unit powered by an interface between two reactive chemistries, oil and alkali. And it could navigate its environment and shed a skin in a strikingly lifelike manner. Now the term protocell is a contested concept. One school of thought led by Steen Rasmussen and others conjecture that it is a fully synthetic or artificial cell. In other words, it meets the full criteria for life. The other viewpoint, the one I share, builds on an origins of life concept that considers the protocell as a lively chemical unit or dynamic droplet as a precursor of true life with no claims on being fully alive. As research on dynamic droplets was taking place at the European Centre for Living Technology in Venice, the architectural applications of this technology I proposed sought to transform the dead city infrastructure into a lifelike system. Future Venice is an experimental project that explored the relevance of protocell technology to the built environment. Specifically, the project aimed to empower Venice's woodpile foundations with the ability to respond to its rapidly changing surroundings. By strategically adding protocell applications to the rios and canals, the protocells would capture pollutants, dissolved gases and organic waste to dynamically coat the woodpiles at the tidal zone with mineral deposits and become a living reef-like structure. Through cumulative mineral deposition, the city could therefore behave in a lifelike way, self-healing and responding to environmental change without technically being alive. How such a city might be experienced and architecturally developed is explored in my fiction book, Invisible Ecologies. So here's an extract. At one time, it may have been enough to simply insert steel pins and plates to stop brickwork from sagging in Venice. But nowadays, the kind of maneuvers needed to shape dynamic masonry requires a knowledge of cosmetic and plastic surgery. When we combine them, we discover new ways of making windows, walls, and doors. With this technique, we can make structures appear just by squeezing out new spaces. Protocell and other agentized chemistries provide a means to explore the principles of designing with metabolism. What we learn from them is that metabolism itself is spatial, not only marking space, but also transforming its surroundings. In other words, a living body changes its environment and is not a neutral presence. So how do we design with this? To answer that question and further advance the principles of biodesign required more than a portfolio of fragile chemical metabolisms. So to develop the architectural concepts further, I looked to the masters of the process, the microbes. The Living Architecture Project forms the third case study and is funded by the EU Horizon 2020 Future Emerging Technologies Open Programme. Our six partners consortium consists of Newcastle University, University of Trento, University of the West of England, the Spanish National Research Council, Explorer Biotech, and Liquid the Systems Group. Now, Living Architecture is a combined utilities platform that takes the form of a bioprocessor wall. It's about the size of a large bookcase and suitable for installation in a kitchen or a bathroom. Living architecture houses microbes, which perform useful domestic work, such as cleaning water, making usable amounts of electricity, and producing a range of metabolites that are fed back into the household system or are safely released to enrich the natural environment, establishing a circular economy of the household. Altering the effect of our domestic lifestyles on the environment 
where constituent households do not just consume resources, but also generate housework, living architecture transforms the notion of waste. The bioprocessor wall itself is made up of bricks. These double up as integrated building blocks where each brick is also a next generation selectively programmable bioreactor and ideal home for microbes. Three different kinds of bricks are used in the wall, the microbial fuel cell, an algae photo bioreactor, and a synthetic consortium bioprocessor. Each type of brick supports different kinds of microbes and together they are assembled as modularly stacking standardized building segments. Now these bricks are fed with liquid domestic waste in the form of urine and gray water. And then they're sequentially configured like a cow stomach where each bioprocessor differentially turns their feedstock into end metabolites that are moved onto the next chamber where further transformations take place and so on. Each module or brick is selectively programmable being assigned a particular task or identity and a range of outputs can be produced by altering the microbial populations and spatially sequencing the bioprocessors. So the system can be thought of as a metabolic app. Two basic types of metabolism are used in living architecture. One is anaerobic based on a technologically mediated composting process that can be harvested for electricity, water and oxygen. As a standalone unit, it's known as a microbial fuel cell, which is a kind of battery that's powered by organic waste and is made up of an anode, a selective membrane and a cathode. The hardware captures electrons from the bioelectrical activity of the biofilm that forms on the membrane to provide small amounts of usable electricity. At the same time, the fuel cell cleans water and produces other metabolites. The system is self-powered and its actions in the living architecture system are coordinated by an AI, which detects the amount of electricity produced by each brick and regulates the inputs accordingly to optimize the system outputs. The other metabolism is photosynthesis, which is carried out by tiny green organisms or algae in a photobioreactor that traps sunlight and carbon dioxide, and that's used to produce solid biomass. Our system is gravity fed with a unique geometry and triple baffle system that promotes mixing. The main challenge of the project is to bring the different systems together so their various products can be meaningfully exchanged. We achieve this by boosting the electrical... Uh, thanks everybody. Uh, we, we have a technical difficulty and uh, we'll try to get Rachel back soon. Don't go away. Um, we'll restore this uh, and uh, be back online in a few minutes. Thanks for your patience. Great, back on track. <laughs> so we were talking about two different metabolisms um, so the first one's anaerobic and this one is photosynthesis. And so we've got these tiny green organisms that are gravity fed, feeding off sunlight and carbon dioxide, and they're being mixed by the geometry of the bioreactor alone. And they're producing oxygen. And then we're using that to grab the electrons from the microbial fuel cell, increase the power. And then the reason that this is really exciting for us is because it starts to um, achieve integratability between the two systems, which changes this idea of waste products because the outputs of one can be used directly by another, generating this really important cyclical economy of matter powered by metabolism. So there were actually three bioreactor types that we developed. And so this is the final bioprocessor type, which is a synthetic consortium bioprocessor, which examined the biological flexibility of the metabolic apps. So it allowed us to design the chemistry, helping us establish just how far we can design the actual metabolic reactions using synthetic biology techniques. So the configuration is inspired by the microbial fuel cell, so you might recognize that. And the synthetic bioprocessor is made up of two chambers, a farm and a labor module, which are also like the microbial fuel cell, separated by a selectively permeable membrane. But it works differently. The farm system 
feeds the labor modules with a rich supply of carbon from organisms that overproduce sugar. So they're designed to do that. This sugar then passes through the membrane into the labor module and reaches workhorse organisms whose genes are well known. So that means that we've got a bag of genes that we can use to design metabolisms with. Now, the sugar rich environment enables the design of new metabolisms as under these conditions, a mixed population of modified microbes will form a consortium. And that enables us to mix and match gene sequences between different species in ways that are not possible in nature. So these new metabolisms could reclaim phosphate from detergents. They could remove polluting nitrous gases from the air. And the ability to stitch different metabolic building blocks together between microbial species greatly increases the metabolic range for design and enables us to work with these processes at scale. And so during this process, we developed two new genes. One's been patented and one's got another patent pending. We also produced a new software called Dulix. Um, you can go online, it's free. Um, it's a web-based DNA library design tool that makes gene sequencing more intuitive. And throughout the project, we considered the social acceptability of the technology through various brick prototypes that were exhibited in biennales and international exhibitions. And so this is a first prototype here, which was just a simple hack of a brick, um, turning it into a microbial fuel cell and bringing together structure and process. And this uh, particular prototype was displayed at the Building Centre in London and during the Venice Architecture Biennale. Substrates that could simultaneously host unlike environments were also developed, um, such as this brick for the fourth Tillin Architecture Biennale in 2017. Um, and this links together photosynthetic and anaerobic organisms, enabling them to exchange metabolites. And our final brick prototype, based on this principle, is more ambitious. It contained four chambers separated by ceramic plates, where we reclaimed 100% of the phosphate introduced into the system. So it was extremely efficient. And this diagram shows you the spatial sequencing of the Living Architecture Project. And this completes the metabolic app because I mentioned earlier that actually the spatial configuration of the different metabolisms is really important in what kinds of products we get out of the system at the end. Now the final wall system used synthetic organisms so it was explored in a laboratory rather than in a social context. And although we couldn't use the living architecture wall in a public setting owing to the presence of the uh, modified organisms, a prototype wall system was shown at the Whitechapel Gallery in collaboration with artist Cecile B. Evans as part of the Is This Tomorrow exhibition. Now the installation is an apartment space where a screen system is powered by unmodified organisms within a microbial fuel cell array. And the work can be thought of as a post-human household inhabited by ghosts of the past, present and future. And from these building blocks of inhabitation, we can start to transform our abundant waste into substances that sustain us and start to reconfigure our homes, our economies and our cities. So they are fit for a 21st century regenerative society where our everyday activities of daily living are transformed into world making actions. Now this final case study is based on near future projections for the Living Architecture Project in particular, based on insights related to the ongoing pandemic. So far, we've considered the body, agents that defy conventions of life and spaces that process metabolism, the currency of life. And each of these has an important part to play in the COVID-19 pandemic where an unexpected further avenue for applications of living architecture arose. So spotlighting the presence of microbes all around us, the recent lockdown confined us to indoor spaces where even before the crisis, we usually spend around 90% of our time. Now that we're spending even more of our time inside, we can think beyond the biology of the virus and into the complex systems that shape the spread of the pandemic, specifically, we can consider how transmission chains can be interrupted within our domestic environments, where we are most likely 
to contract the virus. By regulating the overall microbial health of indoor spaces through the installation of living architecture. Now, currently, cities like New Haven, Connecticut are using sewers as COVID-19 early warning systems to track the level of the novel coronavirus circulating inside their populations. So if someone's infected, shows up in their feces, even before they might feel sick. Our collecting samples from sewage systems provides public health officials with population scale data on the extent of the outbreak. Similarly, fed with waste from our bodies and our natural mi microbiota and any pathogens, the living architecture bioprocessor system is also a highly localized sewage system. And a particularly interesting observation, which has been explored since an early stage in the development of the Living Architecture Project in relationship to removing stray synthetic organisms is the ability of microbial fuel cells to kill disease causing pathogens in their feedstock. So demonstrated by the University of the West of England by the removal of hepatitis B and other pathogens from waste streams Early findings are not only a novel breakthrough for the sanitation sector, but also create opportunities for regulating the microbiome of the built environment, acting like an external immune system. So at some point, our microbiota reach the microbial fuel cells, where through microbial action, they're either incorporated into the anaerobic biofilm or removed from the system. So once a person or community's microbiota and micro um, you know, biomolecules have entered into the living architecture system, they can then be used for health monitoring more generally. With its integrated, cybernetically organized systems of artificial intelligence, sensors, microbial actors, and robotic actuators, living architecture provides a programmable infrastructure that helps rethink the management of our individual and collective health within indoor spaces to attenuate, for example, outbreaks of infectious disease. Providing a platform for the early detection, localization, and even removal of pathogenic agents from the indoor environment, a near future scenario within a building is upon the detection of pathogens in the system and an AI and robotic actuators within the living architecture infrastructure then activate air conditioners to operate an early warning system that then implements an institutionally determined protocol depending on its organism and context. So while living architecture won't solve the immediate COVID-19 crisis in its current form, particularly as COVID-19 has rarely been found in urine, it does alert us to the near future role of the productive actions of microbes within the home environment and even workplaces that enable new forms of economy, health, medicine, public health and disease prevention, all while making clean energy. Although these latter scenarios are speculative right now, future outbreaks of infectious disease will worsen with the climate emergency and will not be won through an exclusively biological approach that only focuses on a specific organism. As we have already witnessed during the ongoing pandemic, our behaviors are also critical in our health and well-being. And living architecture enables the effective microbial design of our living spaces. While it does not deal with viruses directly, the bioprocessor complex manages the virome through its relationship with other microbes, which have already established appropriate strategies for dealing with them. Working with live microorganisms as an extension of their existing co-inhabitation with us creates the possibility of a new relationship with nature that comprises a different way of acting, thinking about and valuing the entire community of life in all its strangeness. Life is not fixed. Biology has a dynamic physical and cultural relationship with all life's processes and how we relate to them. Such irreducibly complex exchanges are constantly being negotiated and are situated at the heart of biodesign's inquiry. 
This principle is played out in my work on display at the Parallel Biology Exhibition curated by Professor Jean Jaminet that is running from now until December, which references experimental approaches towards alternative conceptions of life in terms of their philosophy and methods. These portraits of life that interrogate the limits of living agents challenge our ethical responsibilities towards them and invoke the irreducible complexity of an animated world. Collectively, they present a parallel view of the living realm, but not as you know it. Such innovative perspectives that interrogate existing conventions are only one of the many challenges that biodesign faces in becoming part of the mainstream portfolio for human development. From a commercial view, the general marketplace for biodesign is just beginning to produce products such as victimless meat and spiderless silk. With most developments still confined to the laboratory, the field is hard to regulate and scale, and it's not yet a mainstream mode of manufacturing. Despite growing interest in products like biobricks and mycofoam, biodesign has not been convincingly de demonstrated at efficiencies of scale that compete with industrial production methods. However, the real economic value of biodesign is not in complying with existing modes of living and working, but reinventing them. The products of biodesign are also hard to regulate by current conventions as they raise novel questions about rights, ethics, and ownership of the subjects. For example, is it acceptable to patent genes? It also raises even bigger questions about how shall we care for our inventions? What are our responsibilities towards them? And even how do they regard us? Most importantly, biodesign plays an essential ongoing role in questioning our assumptions about the community of life and our role within it. The paradigm shifting potential of biodesign has only just begun and offers us no reason to suppose its futures can be predictably extrapolated from points in the present. Not all evolutionary routes are direct, efficient or linear. Not all outcomes are immediately understandable or profitable according to the dominant economic model. But by offering ways of considering our responsibilities to the living realm through different frameworks, biodesign itself is empowering and helps us address new challenges in unconventional ways that are ethically grounded. Something occurs when working along with the agents of life, something connected to perhaps the most important things that ambitious collaborations can offer, an insight into the world beyond humans, a commitment to shaping an uncertain future an investment in those who will be shaping that future and the formation of multi-species communities which through a negotiated position of trust and sharing can make all the difference in the world. I've covered a lot yet not enough in this talk tonight and I'd like you to uh, think about maybe further reading so if you do then here is a selection of academic books and here is a section of some fiction books for those who want uh, something well different. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel, for such a wonderful talk. As I noted earlier, um, Professor Armstrong will be taking questions via chat. So um, please uh, do take this opportunity to, um, to uh, type your questions there. Um, and we will be fielding um, as many as we are, are able to. Um, in the meantime, um, I will invite everyone to watch a brief one minute video. Uh, that's a preview of the exhibition, uh, Parallel but biology after which we will begin the Q&A session.
Okay. So we have a question that's related to um, the idea of microbes and buildings having microbes is a fascinating concept. Um, you spoke to this a bit about kind of lobbying, but the question is uh, asking what sort of lobbying or codes you anticipate might be needed or kind of the catchment of uh, ways to kind of address this within that context. Yeah, so I, this, is, this is a great question because obviously there are health and safety issues um, with thinking about introducing microbes into places that people live. But I also just want to say that modernity has given us the solution that we live in sterile environments. And if you think um, modernity ends at the plug in your kitchen sink um, and at the rim of your toilet bowl, um, that we actually still do, um, you know, quite quite comfortably cohabit with, with, with microbes. Um, and so the, the petition really is for, um, let's say, a sensible kind of regulatory regime and appropriate design and curation and oversight for working along with microbial communities. I mean, so soils, for example, are unregulated microbes <laughs> that surround us, um, you know, the second we step outside of a building and even within buildings themselves. Um, you know, there are these microbiomes. So I, I think it really requires a rethinking um, you know, from first principles, from an academic perspective as to what a healthy relationship with microbes is. Think about what the existing regulations are within um, uh, a practice and a profession that exists within the reign of a hygiene where everything should be sterile. Um, and finding uh, ways of prototyping the possibilities, uh, demonstrating them, showing that they're safe and um, developing good rituals of hygiene, but not in a aseptic world, in a world that has its kind of baseline healthy probiotic microbiota. So I don't know what the answer is, but I think we're, we're kind of caught between two worlds of thinking right now. And um, it's going to require some thought and experiment to make that transition. The next question is one about um, education um, and the future of architecture and design and what might be in, kind of, in your experience kind of context and ideas for pathways in educating um, in this kind of arena. Right, this is, this is a really good question and there's, I think there's no simple answer because um, we don't actually know what the knowledge is that we need in order to navigate the, the next phase of our uh, human development. So I think we need a diverse and experimental multidisciplinary, um, uh, let's say, context for the education of students and that's across disciplines. So I think that architects and designers should be working with scientists and technologists in a goal oriented or let's say challenge oriented um, um, you know, projects that allow them to problem solve together, to, to rehearse the idea of dealing with the unknown, to um, practice thinking outside of a comfort level and experimenting and exploring and starting to understand what works what needs to change. So I think that the idea of actually fundamental research um, within the studio, uh, within the university, at the level of you know, masters, um, I would say would be a, a good, good start so that every single architect graduating will be able to conduct research whether they are in practice or whether they continue into academia because we really need a, a whole generation of experimental architects asking big questions about what already exists and what is possible. Um, and uh, you know, with that, I think they would then be equipped to find the new knowledge um, that we need in order to make this transition from an industrial to an ecological era. Great, so the next question is about um, the bio brick and um, the assumptions that in the end, um, it's designed for general use. And a question if there are opportunities or considerations of how that might 
um, the features of the biobrick and microbes be incorporated into um, specific contexts? Yeah, um, that's a wonderful question because essentially um, these are batteries, okay? Um, and whilst they don't produce the same level of electricity as a chemical battery, um, they produce usable amounts of electricity. And when we think about the amount of electricity we draw into our home from a 230 volt supply, and we step it down um, to some, some appliances, it's only a few volts. So why are we doing that? I think we need um, an age of reconsideration of appliances that are low volt. So, um, you know, LEDs and, um, uh, you know, certain devices, you know, are in a good position to use bioelectricity. And others like washing machines and fridges may need material innovation so that we get, um, you know, thermocaloric material. So stretching and um, compressing um, uh, let's say a surface to heat or cool your food rather than using a machine to use energy. I think so there's, a, there's an age of innovation like that. Um, but then I think absolutely right that the, that the um, bio brick is, is essentially an infrastructure. So then it becomes about the design and creativity of the architect, of the engineer, as to how that power is used um, to um, you know, appropriately live our lives on a, on a lower um, energy level. Um, I'm really looking forward to things like you know, the 12 volt home. And I know that there are people pioneering that space right now. So um, I really think this is, this is feasible and it's a, um, it's, it's a, it's a proper challenge. Um, and um, what's interesting about the 12 volt home is that that is a level that could be entirely produced by our waste. So off grid. <laughs> The next question is about the Venice project. Um, and they're wondering about the reaction from the existing authorities um, and the preservation regime, regimes. Um, yeah. Yes. So, I mean, obviously, um, uh, as a world uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site, uh, we weren't able to, um, uh, let's say, experiment with um, uh, protocells in the Venetian waters. However, we did go out with Red Bull and we carried these big fish tanks and used Venetian water and demonstrated the um, calcification of the outer skins of little protocells um, in the water. So that's really about as far as we get so far. Um, it really needs a lot more development in terms of the technology in order for it even to be, um, you know, considered by UNESCO. So um, what, what the protocell technology and the project Future Venice did though, was about revealing what it means to design and engineer with metabolism. That was the big advance with Future Venice, uh, which led to the Living Architecture Project. So it was, it was valuable as a visualization tool um, and as a, let's say a rendering, a model um, that allowed us to think through how something changes, not just itself, but also its environment. One question, one more question. Um, I was educated by physicians, some of whom believe we have the ability and have exercised the ability to alter our environment faster than we can adapt to it. Um, have we passed the point of no return? I think in evolution, you've, you've always passed the point of no return. You can probably go around in circles. <laughs> So I, I think I think change is is something that's always there. I don't think we really perfectly circle anything. We're on this spiral of um, you know kind of iteration. So every life cycle that happens, every cell metabolism that has happened is is just slightly different than the one before. So um, yeah, I think the thing about life is it's always past the point of no return, and it's compelled to change, compelled to adapt compelled to think itself into the next set of impossible um, challenges that it's got somehow or other to figure out. So, I mean, I love life because it's irrepressible <laughs> and it's absolutely disobedient. So uh, it's, it's a great model uh, for, for thinking through. Fantastic. 
Well, with that, I think we're going to wrap up. But before doing so, um, Esri would like to thank Dean Mistur, our CAD gallery curator, assistant professor Jean Geminet, and the amazing gallery team of students. Um, we'd also like to thank Kent State's Division of Research and Sponsored Programs, Vice President Di Carletto, Michael Kabalik, um, and the uh, symposi Symposium Planning Committee, um, and our Esri Symposium Chair, Associate Professor Margarita Benitez, and today's distinguished speaker, Professor Armstrong. Um, thank you everyone for your attendance today. And um, in final closing, I invite all of you to view Parallel Biology on exhibition now through October 14th. Everyone be well.